welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast with Borg, Betts, and a baller. Welcome in, boys and girls. It's Wednesday, May 17th here on the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. I'm joined by Matthew Betts and Jason Moore. And boys, this is the seventh episode of the Dynasty Podcast. It's the number of perfection, so let's not screw it up. I don't see how well, I know could, I Kyle. won't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, me and, J- and Jason, we are going to just crush this. Yeah, Kyle, do not let us down. You're If this show... If this show has a drastic mistake made, it will be 100% because of you, Kyle. You know, I'm trying to navigate hosting. I, I have to play I play Andy's role, and I know mm-hmm. Andy never screws it up, so you're just used to thousands of shows. Pure where, perfection. <laughs> that's how it was at the very beginning, too. Just perfection right from the start. Right Episode off seven. the bat. Yep, by seven, we had all the kinks worked out. <laughs> You know, if I, I could if I wanted to, because it's one of my hobbies is to go back through and I'll find oh, episodes. No, 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 no. Let's focus on the task at hand here today, talking some range of outcomes on dynasty players. Yeah, Betts and I, we've recorded a lot together, so I know he's never heard me screw up. But yes, on this episode, we will be talking about a range of outcome for players. And I think often people look at rankings and say, this is what this player is, this is what we think they are. People go to trade calculators, trade charts, whatever. You get a singular number. But every single player in the NFL kind of has a range of outcomes of what they could be, what could happen if things go right, things go wrong. And then there are players like Keenan Allen where you just know this is who he is. He is safe. He is great. Some say he's the greatest wide receiver of all time. One says that. I just want to. <laughs> I was going to say some, Kyle. I think it's literally one person on this earth and he's in this room. Somebody asked me the other day, who's on my Mount Rushmore of fantasy football players? And usually, like, LT is the answer for people. But I was just like, for me, like, for me personally, playing fantasy football, it's Keenan Allen. Like, he's been one of my favorite players. It's just four different facial expressions of Keenan Allen <laughs> chiseled into that mountain. This is Keenan happy. This is Keenan angry. This is Keenan sexy. What would the fourth be there if... It's if- Keenan singing because he was on the mass oh, singer. Oh, very nice. Yeah, he's 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 a great dude. We won't be talking about Keenan Allen anymore on this episode, but if you want to get all of our rankings, our updated tiers, you know, everything else that we're putting in the ultimate draft kit, Jason, you are churning away right now. You just finished your initial projections for the ultimate draft kit. It's a labor of love. So at this point in the process, are you are you breathing? Are you alive? I am so much better now that I am not basically statting from the time I wake up until two in the morning every day diving deep but it, you know the the thing that I love about that process is it prepares you differently you know we, we rank players very easily or we we can even just poop out stat lines very quickly and easily and that's you, not what we do you poop them out no we could oh okay. we could take just a quick and easy dump maybe a dukalak style let's just get it out as quick as we can and we don't do that here thank you we dive deep we're looking into the research we're watching the press releases we're uh looking at historical data coaching to everything we can get our hands on and even though sometimes the numbers come out kind of just what you expect. Like it's almost it's disappointing sometimes when it's like you you pour all this research in and you go and you make this stat line and you're like yeah that's what that's exactly what I thought it would be. Uh that is more disappointing than when you get the surprise. But it's the process that actually helps the rest of the season. And like when we're talking about the range of outcomes on today's episode, it's the process of research and investigation and all of that that actually sets us up to have a good idea not just of what their medium outcome could be but like what is their range of outcomes and and you know we were talking before the show Kyle the way at least I approach the way I hope that our listeners approach fantasy football is to think about everything in terms of like betting not 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 betting like you know, putting money on the line probabilities but, but probabilities like everything is just a bet on do you think this is likely do you think this is very likely do you think the reward is great um etc etc et and and that's where you win in fantasy and 
in the Ultimate Draft Kit this year, we will have an upside meter for players. So I know you're going through, and it's not just, here's a projection, that's it, that's the only thing. You're also saying, okay, well, what if this player hits an 80 percentile outcome, a 90 percent out outcome? Like, it, it's it's in the range of outcomes, and so that's what we're talking about on the show. Bets, you are knee-deep in blurbing every single player, every injury, every single update. So I even saw you uh, getting to write Chase Claypools and just laugh your butt off uh, writing about him. That guy, man. I was done with Chase Claypool the second he ruined my Eagles <laughs> a couple years ago, in which I actually went down a little path. Um, accounted for about 15% of his career fantasy points <laughs> came in that rookie season four touchdown game against the Eagles. That's how much in the weeds we are right now currently with this stuff. So yeah, blurbing all these guys and it's been helpful a ton, you know, to like look back on all these guys and understand what their season was, what's changed, what could be this season. Um, I think it's, you know, I love our process. They're like, you know, Andy, Mike and Jason, they sat these guys out, which is a lot harder of the work than what Kyle and I have to do, which is fantastic. And then we kind of get to add like the context around it and it just marries everything beautifully. Um, so it's been fun, man. And I love it. And I think everyone in the UDK is going to absolutely crush this year. Yeah, you can get that at ultimatedraftkit.com. I want to start off the show with a quick question about second year wide receivers. And Jason, a couple of years ago, uh, we this was kind of a hot topic that we talked about. This is the sophomore bump. And if you can get certain wide receivers you know, in a certain window in the draft, then they're going to be even more valuable, especially in Dynasty. So let's name a second-year wide receiver you expect to make the leap. And then I want you to kind of define what that leap means. Like, we can all say that they'll probably improve a little bit from the rookie year. I think that's not hard to say. But how high can a player go? And then in Dynasty, is this player about to be just untouchable? Like, you know, we're at the point now where you just can't trade for Justin Jefferson. You're not going to be able to trade for Jamar Chase. But you might still have a window with these players where they haven't hit that peak yet, and maybe you think they can go there. So, Jason, I'll let you start first. Sure. I'm going to take a guy who had a terrible rookie season, who uh, I, I believe a lot of fantasy managers look at him as a bust already. And if you do, <laughs> I would recommend, uh, or if or if the manager who has this player does, I would recommend kicking the tires and seeing if you can acquire one trail on Burks. Uh, wide receiver for the Tennessee Titans last year, a.k.a. A.J. Brown's replacement uh, in a one-for-one -one trade during the draft last year. But the Titans had a miserable season. They sucked. The team got injured. Trail on Burks had just an injury-riddled season. If you remember, coming into uh, training camps, there was all the asthma worries all of a sudden Traylon Burks was not able to play professional football even though he played even though he was a great collegiate athlete now he's got asthma which he already had and the the negativity then he got injured starts slow misses the middle of the season comes back looks looks pretty good but he's still not getting a ton of snaps gets a concussion misses a couple games so it was a real hodgepodge of a season but he was actually good and I think that would surprise a handful of people to realize that when he was on the field, his targets per route run, he was 21.3%. He was earning targets when he was out there. That is the same as the rookie years of Jamar Chase and A.J. Brown. That is one of the most important statistics, the targets per route run. The, that is the definition of earned value on the football field for wide receivers. That's the number one stat that I like to look at to say, dude, when he is running a route, is the quarterback saying, I got to go to him? Because he was in his rookie year. His yards per route run, 1.75, same as the rookie years of Jalen Waddell and Amon Ross St. Brown. He is a good player. The depth chart is not a depth chart. It is a death chart uh, for the wide receiver room in, in Tennessee. Let me read it to you. It's Traylon Burks, and I'm done. I'm done. I don't want to give you any of the other names. Don't come at me with anything else. They're, they, they're not worth talking about. So to me, Traylon Burks showed flashes. He has high draft capital, a first-round draft pick, and his value is so low because of the missed season. The, the wheels fell off for Tennessee. Let me ask you something. When you think about the Tennessee Titans last year, were they good? not really they're uh, middle I don't think of the people, road yeah i don't think people would associate good with the titans because they right. associate good with 
the Bills and the Bengals. Yeah, week like 10. Week 10 last year. What do you think their record was? Top of your head. I'm going to say 500. Sure. Yeah. Give them a little bit of grace. They were 7-3. and three. They were 7-3 and three through week 10 because Mike Vrabel's a great coach. Then the wheels fell off. Injuries happened all around them. They lose their last seven games and kind of quit on the season because they had to. And um, I, I trust Vrabel. I trust what my eyeballs said on Traylon Burks. So I'm in on Traylon Burks. Uh, I think he'll have a great season this year. And as far as to answer your question at the beginning, Kyle, what do we expect that second year leap to look like? My expectation not my hope, but my expectation is that he's a 120 target player, around 70, 80 receptions, a deep ball player that can score some big touchdowns, and is a is a, a low end wide receiver too for fantasy. And I, I love where you can get him right now because people look at the Titans, they look at Ryan Tannehill and Derrick Henry and say, well, we don't know what this team's going to be. We don't know if Will Levis is the answer long term. But all we care about is. For wide receivers, do they have a talent? Do they earn targets? And I would say right now he's undervalued in Dynasty where a year from now, we could easily be talking about Traylon Burks as a top 15 wide receiver very easily, but he's not valued that way. Betts, hit us with the next one. Yeah, Jason went with one that's, I think, a little bit off the board in terms of these these uh, last year's you know uh, NFL picks of who can make the leap. Mine is more chalk, but when you talk about range of outcomes, this is a guy that I think could be an untouchable in Dynasty a year from now, a guy who is going to, I think, unless something crazy happens, post a wide receiver one for uh, season for fantasy this year. That is Garrett Wilson, who you talk about the efficiency metrics for a player like this, you know, 25% target share, 23.4% targets per route run, 1.85 yards per route run, and no wide receiver in the NFL forced more missed tackles than Garrett Wilson last season. He's got the top 10 NFL draft capital we look for, and he did all of those things with some guys named Mike White and Zach Wilson. Let's just put some numbers to how bad those guys were last year. This is based off PFF numbers. Among quarterbacks with 100-plus dropbacks last season, Zach Wilson, 48th out of 48 quarterbacks in PFF grade. Not he good. was also 48th, a.k.a. dead last, in adjusted completion percentage. How about Mike White? We all love the Mike White fantasy weeks where we could stream him as you know a QB1 you know fringe guy. But the numbers weren't good. He was 38th in, in PFF grade, 41st in adjusting completion percentage. And 92nd is where Garrett Wilson ranked in terms of catchable targets last season per player for profiler. So you're getting all of that stuff. And even if Aaron Rodgers isn't Patrick Mahomes, he's a heck of a lot better than those two dudes that were thrown in the football last year. So you have this ultra-talented player with a monster, monster quarterback upgrade. Garrett Wilson, to me, is a guy that, yes, he's expensive to acquire in Dynasty, but he is a cornerstone piece for your roster, a guy that is going in the top five, six, seven picks this time next year. I, I'm sad to report that I traded him away Oh, what last an week. idiot. Wait, last week? Loser. Last week. Last week. Last week? What did you What did you? Uh, we get? can talk about it on here. It was a trade that, you know, kind of throw around to a couple other people. It was in a super flex, so keep that in mind. But I traded away Garrett Wilson, Russell Wilson, and Alexander Madison okay. for Nick Chubb, Kyler Murray, mm -hmm. and Jahan Dotson. Okay, so you got a, you got a young wide receiver back. You were going after a high-end quarterback in a super flex league. And Nick Chubb. And Nick Chubb is very good. It, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fair trade, but it is, it's got to make you sad to it, lose it does. Garrett Wilson because, it, you know, we've said the, the phrase a couple times, but there are very few untouchable players in Dynasty. Right now, the untouchables, the full, there's nothing you can do to get them. I think there's only two. It's just Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase. Unless you're in a super flex league and then maybe you want to throw like a Patrick Mahomes in there. But, uh, you know, those two guys, if I had them, I d you couldn't, like, I'll give you all my draft picks in the future forever. I'd be like, I'm good. I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep these guys for eight, eight years of dominance. Yeah, it was painful, and I think for me, in Superflex, I thought that Kyler was undervalued, and that's even something I know you've talked about as well. So I think it evened my team out. I think Garrett Wilson's the best player in the deal. But I want to throw out Chris Olave. He's been my boy for a while. He was my <clears throat> he was my, my guy last year. Um, I won my guy. We get to pick one, Jason. You get to pick three. But I Yeah, no, I, I love it. You, you put your flag uh, right in between his first name and his last name, said this is, this is Chris Kyle's Olave. 
and he had a great rookie season. Yeah, his targets per route run number, 27.6, is ridiculous. His yards per route run number, ridiculous. Like These are top five among rookie wide receivers since 2014. But his deep balls, that if you watch the tape, there's a lot that was not on there between Winston and Dalton. We get Derek Carr, who's been third in deep attempts over the last three years. I think he should be valued, and most people see him as a fringe or right around top 10 dynasty wide receiver. I think after this year, we could be talking about Chris Olave as being in that top five group with Garrett Wilson, but I think he's seen as like a tier below Wilson in a lot of people's mind, but I love the setup for him. And for us, like we're looking at these players now and just saying, can they jump even more in value? And often these second year wide receivers do. So if you want to get them now, you totally can. I almost said Drake London because I think he's being undervalued. I almost said Jahan Dotson. Like I really think you could hit four or five of these guys and they could be awesome. I think it is a little bit more questionable when you start going down the, the road with what is John Mechie? What is Tyquan Thornton? What is George Pickens? Like I don't know any of those players. I can't be firm on them, but we've seen the players we listed be good on a per route basis. Yeah, and, and one of the biggest cheat codes in fantasy is second year wide receivers. We brought that up for a, a while, many, many years uh, in the past. We've talked about that, and that's for redraft. Um, obviously, Dynasty, if you're talking about second year wide receivers, their value is even better because you've gotten their rookie year out of the way, which usually isn't their fantasy gold, and they're still obviously super young with their entire career ahead of them. So they cost more in Dynasty, but they are still 100% worth it. They, if, if you can get your hands on second-year wide receivers in trades, <clears throat> do it. All right, let's talk about our range of outcomes. Dig deeper, y'all. Let's go! I like going deep in the archives and finding drops that <laughs> – did you remember we had that drop? <laughs> no, but I, I do like that it barely applies. Thank I mean, you, it's thank just you. Like, this is this is. I was waiting to hear the like <laughs> range of outcomes, and it's like dig deeper, yo. <laughs> I was thinking the exact same thing. I was like, how does this fit this segment? It um, fits perfectly. Fun. I, I love it. When I get to control the ship, I just like to throw things out there every once in a while, just just because they're sitting there in the Dropbox that the world just doesn't get to see them. So. We're going to be digging a little bit deeper here, talking about a range of outcomes of six different players in Dynasty. And the goal here is to show people that a rank is a starting point, but it is not the end. Each player kind of has a high-end outcome, a median, and a low-end. And so for each player, I think we want to give you a roadmap of what they could be. How could you value them? Is there some inefficiencies in your league like do people not value them as much or do they overvalue them because they think oh this player is just going to be the best ever so I want to start off by giving a player that we have never seen take an NFL snap but we are very intrigued and it's Anthony Richardson quarterback Indianapolis Colts 22 years old he was taken fourth overall and on our rookie shows we kind of got to share what he can be for fantasy his ups his downs in our rookie rankings, we have him as the 102 in Superflex Leagues behind Bijan, and I took him there in a league, and I, I'm excited. I'm excited. I actually got to pair him with Kyler, Kyler and Anthony Richardson in that league. But in terms of startup ranks, in terms of best ball, right now he's kind of seen as a top 10 quarterback for 2023, but for Dynasty, a lot of things can change. So I want to lay out, and you guys, we get to fill in the picture together. What would it look like a year from now for Anthony Richardson to be even more valuable in dynasty. Like that's the, that's the high end outcome. And we're not saying, you know, that's going to happen. We're saying that's a 20% chance. I don't know. 15%. If Anthony Richardson runs for 600 yards, he'll be one of three rookie quarterbacks to accomplish that. Okay. 600 yards. Would you guys say that's a really high bar in year one? It doesn't feel like a really high bar for him. It, it It is historically a very high number, but it's difficult for me to imagine him not getting 600 yards. Yeah. The, here's the players that have done that over the last decade. Okay, 600 yards is a rookie. RG3, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson. Like, that. that's the kind of company we're saying. And so when, we're look, when I'm looking at our projections in the UDK, I'm filtering those and saying, okay, what does this mean historically? If Anthony Richardson were to hit 600 yards, and we still have to talk about him as a passer, 
I don't know, Betts, does that start to move him in your mind, if he did that, into being near like a Justin Fields in Dynasty? What's funny is right before you said that, I was looking at uh, what we have on the dock here as far as rankings, and Justin Fields' name stuck out to me almost perfectly as a similar trajectory of what I could see happen. You know, we all love Justin Fields in fantasy. There are flaws in him as a passer. I mean, that is just flat out the truth about him as an NFL passer. And a lot of the knock on Anthony Richardson was, look, he's the most athletic quarterback of all time at the Combine. He runs like crazy. We love that for fantasy. But we're not sure how good of a passer he is going to be. And this is a completely different conversation of NFL and and fantasy. But Justin Fields is still here. And Justin Fields is going to run. And it's going to be very valuable for fantasy and for your dynasty roster. They just used the fourth overall pick on this guy. So even if he's not great as a thrower this year and he does show flashes of you know the Lamar the Justin Fields the Kyler Murray earlier in his career type of upside of rushing his value will not only maintain but it will surely go up entering year two because the Colts are committed to him for the next three four years at a minimum yeah you basically if you think that Richardson is going to increase in value you need him to hit that rushing line of around five six hundred yards at least and then maybe you think he's going to have one of those epic rookie years. Like, he's being drafted right now in redraft leagues as if he's RG3 or, you know, he's going to put together like a Justin Herbert rookie season. I think that's a lot to ask for him in the in year one, Jason. It's it's ridiculous. Um, I know this is a dynasty show, uh, but obviously we, we most dynasty players play in redraft as well. And I do think that in redraft, he's, he's being drafted for a ceiling outcome that we talk about making just odds on probability you know what what is the what are the chances that he does hit and he's you know a top eight quarterback in his rookie season I put those chances sub 20 percent if I look back at the great examples of the players that we want Anthony Richardson to develop into you look at Josh Allen right Josh Allen comes out his rookie year and through his first six games before he got injured, he was on pace for 2,500 yards, five passing touchdowns, and 14 interceptions while rushing for 439 yards. Anthony Richardson is very inexperienced. He has not started a lot of high-level games. He is not going to get off to a quick start in his rookie year. You look at Justin Fields. His entire rookie season, he averaged 10.6 fantasy points. <laughs> Not good. Those are two players we want right now desperately in Dynasty because they're awesome, because they're great. They're going to rush for six, 700 yards, 800 yards, six, seven, eight rushing touchdowns. And Anthony Richardson, I think, could do that as well. For redraft purposes, I'm not investing in him very highly. I don't think he gets off to a strong start. And in fact, you have seen some of these seasons with Fields early in his career, with Josh Allen early in his career, where the beginning of the season was really, really, really rough. And then they kind of figured out how to unlock his rushing value. And the end of the season is brilliant. Uh, that happened with both of those guys. So to me, Anthony Richardson, his range of outcomes, first of all, the the floor on him is is horrific it's a complete miss he can't fix his accuracy he can't stay on the field because of that he plays for you know two and a half years uh a la you know uh some quarterback drafted number two by the Jets who uh <laughs> sucks and they're like well we should replace him that is the bottom but I do think that his his high-end problem it, it, the 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 odds on betting favorite is for him to succeed for fantasy because as he develops going into year two as a rusher as a passer he pretty much it's going to be very difficult for him to fail for fantasy purposes with everything around him and with his athletic traits with his coaching staff with his uh receiving core so to me if you can't if you didn't get a hold of him in your rookie draft I'm looking at midway through Season one. Yes. Halfway through when he looks like a turd and he's throwing the most embarrassing passes you've ever seen and the clips are going crazy on Twitter, that's when I'm trading for Anthony Richardson at because that'll be his lowest. He's not going to – his lowest is not now. Right now it's all hope and kittens and roses and unicorns and rainbows. 
But halfway through the season, when he's showing the signs that people are going to be victory lapping about where they said he's not a good quarterback, right. trade for him then. Let me give you just some median outcome. Just These are kind of the ex expectations I have when I'm looking at this player in Dynasty is that he's going to show the dual threat ability and moments where you're like, oh, this is awesome. Josh Allen did that as a rookie. Like They had a game where they went to Minnesota and they won as heavy underdogs and he was running all over the field, but the completion rate's not there. Let's say his TD rate is super low. That happens to rookies, right? Like Trevor Lawrence was 2% as a rookie and he saw a massive jump. But I think we, what we can expect is he's probably going to get nine plus starts. Like if he can hit that number, I think he'll get more than that. But if he stays on the field, he gets nine plus starts. QBs with at least nine starts, 75% of them were at least a quarterback one over the next year or two. So I think we can at least establish that he's going to be the starter for you know 10 plus games he's gonna run the td rate might not be very high but all of those things are fine as a rookie we're not expecting him to blow the doors off other than rg3 it's like just doesn't happen for rookie quarterbacks yeah the scary case is he pulls a trey lance he gets injured weird things happen and he, he loses value because people just don't know what he is where right now the unknown is like oh there's there's a massive ceiling to finish as a you know top three quarterback in a couple years. So, Betts, where are you on just how high he can go in the next, I don't know, two to three years? Uh, I mean, we talked about this a little bit with, uh, I think it was with Mike on the quarterback preview show before the NFL draft, and I think I threw out this comp of just like best possible outcome for him is that he turns into a Cam Newton type of player where he's – starting 16 17 games and he's running like crazy and he has a goal line role that he's a goal line back which we've seen this head coach you know use with Jalen Hurts last year so that's the absolute best case scenario that can happen I mean that is certainly possible um, but like you said that's I don't know what what percentile range of outcome that is but that's optimistic I would say um, and you know like you said too like a lot of this stuff doesn't just happen right out of the gate like it's probably going to take several weeks for us to see that type of potential I do think we'll see it at some point. But yeah, I, I, if we look back in two or three years and Anthony Richardson does develop as a passer, does continue to run, he's going to be valued as a top three quarterback in Dynasty. My expectation is that he's going to complete less than 60% of his passes. I don't know what you have. Oh, for sure. What do you have in there, Jason? Uh, I will I will look it up, but there's no way it's above 60%. Right. And I just want to give you some players recently, like early picks. Andrew Luck as a rookie, 54%. Josh Allen, 52%. Trevor Lawrence, right under 60%. Justin Fields, 58.9%. But I, I I looked at this. I wanted to find rookie quarterbacks who were drafted highly in the first round. If they were sub 60%, what did they do next year? And on average, they all rose at least 4%. The only ones that went down, Blake Bortles and Zach Wilson, who we would say like they should not have the been goats. drafted. <laughs> they should not have been drafted in the top five. Yeah, I've got him completing 54% of his passes. Yeah, that's not going to scare me off. Like, I think that's been the, the main bugaboo of like, oh, he can't complete his passes. Like, as a rookie, I'm not expecting him to be over 60%. So that's fine. I think year two is what we really care about in terms of progression. But you're going to have, you're going to take some lumps, I would say. If you took him at the 102 like me, I'm not expecting him in year one to even be a quarterback one for fantasy. And I, I think that's a fair median outcome. But uh, any other thoughts on just his range of outcomes you guys want to give? I feel like we've squeezed the juice out of this orange. From a big Ant Rich? That's what I've been calling him on my team. Oh, okay. Ant Rich. Yeah, it's Anthony Richardson. Just shorten it. Big Ant Rich. But then it sounds like it's my auntie. And I love my auntie. She's, auntie a, she's, she's, a, <laughs> she's a wonderful person, but <laughs> she can't play football quite as well as big Ant Rich. <laughs> I'm going to workshop it in the break. <laughs> What's up, Foot Clan? I think you know it's Dynasty season. The rookie drafts are happening, Dynasty startups, and you want the best information to help you make the best decision because, let's be honest, Dynasty Leagues, this is forever. You're, you're setting the foundation for your team. You don't want to mess up. That's why we pour all of our efforts into the Dynasty Pass part of the UDK+. Plus an absolute rock-solid tool to help you get the best out of your Dynasty League each and every year. We have been updating this thing throughout the offseason. You're going to absolutely love it, and you can get a discount on it right now by going to ultimatedraftkit.com. 
No, I'm staying with it for now. At least on my team, I'm going to stay with the nickname. We're going to talk about a couple running backs here that, well, Alabama running backs, so let's talk about that. They're awesome, no matter who they are. Alabama running back, they're really fun. But I want to talk about Najee Harris first because it's like, although he was an RB1 his first year, he was awesome. Last year, dealt with some injuries, had a good second half. It almost feels like we're over him. Mm -hmm. Like, Okay, he was really cool. He was the one on one a couple years ago, but now he's kind of pushed down and almost forgotten in dynasty circles. He's only 25. He has two years plus a fifth year option. So, really, this guy's going to be under contract with the Steelers for probably at least another three years. And he's good. And he's one of the few players that's going to get 300 touches. So, going into year three, Jason, how are you feeling about Najee? I am feeling fantastic about Najee. And I am shamed for that uh when Andy and I compared our rankings he the one of the biggest surprises for him was how high I had Najee in this year's redraft rankings and I understand why he was surprised uh because he was really stupid uh when he was looking at my rankings that's why because Najee is a very very good football player. He was injured, if you remember. He had the foot problem at the beginning of last year. Betts, you could speak to the specifics of that. But the, the second half of the year, he was really, really good. And that was with Jalen Warren involved, healthy, out there. They have massively improved their offensive line this year. They went out. They signed two players. I mean, this was this was one of the worst offensive lines, you know, over the last two years. And they spend, they trade up and spend a, a high-end draft pick on what could be the best left tackle in the draft. They sign two offensive linemen. They get a steal on Daryl Washington, who's basically, they call him the 6-0 lineman. I believe that's now in his own Twitter bio. So he's one of the rare guys that's going to get 300 touches. He's young. I think he's extremely talented. He can catch the ball. And it's funny because you talk about, Alabama running backs are always good, but we also feel like we're kind of over him. He 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 didn't he didn't explode. He's not the top three running back in fantasy. So like whatever, I'm moving on past him. I'm looking for the next new hotness. You know who that reminds me a lot of? Another Alabama running back who's really good, but we're kind of over him. We're looking for the next new hotness. Josh Jacobs, uh, who fits all of those things, and then last year had a ton of workload, and turns out he's just really good. And he was the number three running back overall. I think Najee is primed right now for a great season and a great three-year window. He is also not beloved in fantasy circles right now. So he makes a perfect trade for candidate to me. Yeah, what's hilarious right now is I love to take notes and, and kind of get myself prepped for the show by handwriting stuff down. And literally, Jason, I wish you could see my paper. I have under Najee Harris... Improved offensive line in round one. Added Darnell Washington, one of the best blocking tight ends in the class. And then I put foot injury in August to remind ourselves of what happened early in the year. Remember when it happened? There was like this whole like short-term scare and then everyone was like, oh, Najee's fine. Like, don't worry about it. Then we found out after the fact it, it was plaguing him more than we really thought. To put numbers to it, weeks one through eight, he averaged 9.4 half PPR points per game. 3.3 yards per carry. Not great. Week 10 on after the bye, he was the RB5 in fantasy, averaged 14.2 fantasy points, 4.1 yards per carry, clearly more healthy, more explosive. And when I was out there in lovely Phoenix, Arizona, I mean, this place is incredible. Visiting you guys in December, I was watching the games with Mike. I was going to say, when did you go? <laughs> in December? Yes. Lovely. Uh, come also on context, out here. The, I'm coming the from of the NFL season and you'll melt into the ground. <laughs> from snow on the East Coast at this time. So it was incredible. But Mike and I are watching the Steelers game. We're like, Najee looks different like he looks so much better now and it was at the end of the year when he was healthy so I agree with you guys it just feels like he's a little undervalued we keep referencing some of this like best ball ADP and value to get a sense of where these guys are at right now and obviously this is a dynasty show but Najee Harris in round four boys I mean <laughs> I mean what's happening I click click the name almost every time uh, he is a guy that I am aggressively trying to go out and get right now based off where the market is valuing him and then maybe in a year or two you look to trade him away again. But right now, it feels like a good time to be in on Najee. The range of outcomes, which is what we're talking about here, I think is so important for Najee because his range of outcomes, there isn't a 
there isn't a bad range of outcomes where he's not a running back two or better, where he's worthless for fantasy. I mean, any player can get injured, miss a season. That's the worst. But if he plays, and keep in mind, he was injured last year and didn't miss a game, hasn't missed a game in his career yet. The The worst case for him is like he's running back 15. That is not that bad of a case, but the best case for him, I still believe he can be the running back three. If Kenny Pickett takes this offense, just he doesn't have to be great. He really doesn't. He just has to take a step forward. And with an improved offensive line, good weapons around him, great coaching, the Steelers should be better this year than they were last year. The touchdown opportunities should be there for Najee. The range of outcomes to me is running back three to running back 15, and it's pretty much... I think it's top heavy. Yeah, in the startup rankings in the Ultimate Draft Kit, Jason, you have him by far the highest between you know your other compadres. And I just think people are looking at him and saying, I just don't think he'll ever get that rookie season back. He'll never be able to hit that. But 300-plus touches is impossible to find. And right now, I think he's being undervalued. I think people are seeing him as he's top 15. You know, that's kind of like where he where he lands, even in dynasty circles, when I think he's a top 10 back. I think you can get a couple more years. And I would say this, a year from now, let's just say he has a, you know, a subpar season, like you mentioned. You know, he, get, he gets the touches, maybe gets injured. He'll still be worth a first-round pick a year from now. Absolutely. And that's something that you want to be able to hold on to. So it's rare to be able to say that about running backs. And Najee's one of those players. So I think he feels stable. I would love to be able to trade for him. And, you know, we'll be talking about him three years from now. Like, oh, then you, then you don't want him. But I... A year, two or three years, you still have. I also think it's important to mention on a dynasty episode his age because his age gets brought up a lot. He's an older back for where he was drafted. He's 25 years old already, and so when he comes up for his second contract, he'll be a little bit older. I don't worry about that age number the way that I, th the way that I think a lot of people do and shouldn't. Running back age, to me, in 2023, in the modern NFL, is not the how many years from their birth is it? It's really their contract situation in the NFL. It's how many years left do they have on their rookie contract? Will they be able to get a second contract? That That's all I care about. You know, and he his legs aren't going to be done and spent and tired by the time he's 26. Um, part of the reason why he was a, a later drafted, you know, NFL player is because he, he – had to sit behind Alabama running backs like of course um so i i don't look at him as a, a, as an age problem the way that some people do do you feel like that's an oversight in our analysis that we just don't track people from the womb like we should we should be you know yeah and and i i think if we can dig a little deeper find out process of conception uh I, you know we'll, we'll look into that for the dynasty pass you know the udk plus we're always taking it to the next level so that'll be you know the that's plus the plus paywall. that's that's a premium for perk. sure you got to go behind the uh, beaded curtain uh to to get access to that uh jameer gibbs is also an alabama <laughs> running back who is pretty hot right now okay in, in our rookie rankings he's right behind Bijan at the 102 in super flex 104, 105, somewhere around there. And obviously, the Lions were pretty hot and heavy for him. They jumped the shark and said, we're going to take you at 12. And the rest of the league says, okay, that okay, I, we liked him too, but apparently you guys liked him a lot. In startup rankings right now, I see him going RB4, 5, 6, 7. And my question is, is that too high? And then I want us to kind of lay out the case for Jameer Gibbs. Like, what would be a really good rookie year in your mind? What would be a year that would cause you to go, ooh, man, maybe we jump a little too high for him and he loses value next year? I just want to kind of lay it out because 21 years old, super young, age 21 rookie running backs just destroy for fantasy. And they also destroy if they get this kind of draft capital. So everything says Gibbs should be the guy and they shipped out Swift. So in your mind, Betts, what would be just a killer rookie season for him and cause you to say he's a top three dynasty running back next year. I mean, the way that happens is is the pre-draft comp that everyone gave him is that you see an Alva Kamara-esque type of rookie season where he's getting peppered with targets over and over again, and we know how valuable that is in fantasy versus a carry. And that realistically, when you look at the depth chart, 
especially adding in the Jamison Williams suspension for the first six games. I'm not saying it's going to be that type of volume, but he certainly will be involved as a pass catcher. So that is, I think, what gets him there. What I'm kind of just pumping the brakes on a little bit and just trying to understand and wrap my head around is this draft capital didn't necessarily match what we thought would happen given his profile of the weight concerns, which I feel like the Dynasty community, as soon as he got the the draft capital, which I, I understand, just immediately were like, all right, this guy is is going to be the bell cow. He's going to be incredible. You know, no questions asked. But these guys that are, are around 200 pounds or less just historically have not given us those outlier elite top five type of seasons. And I feel like people are maybe expecting that is, is certainly possible in his highest range of outcomes. I'm just not sure that sort of ceiling really is there. I don't know. Jason, how many receptions do you have Jameer Gibbs for his rookie year? Because there's only been two rookie running backs in their age 21 season with 50 plus receptions over the last decade. Those players are Saquon and CMC. Mm -hmm. Is he hitting that 50 mark? I have him hitting that 50 mark. I have him with 83 receptions. I can't fathom a world where you spend a the, the 12th pick overall when there were great players on the board that your team desperately needs, unless you have a plan of action for how to involve him in the passing game. You also have Jamison Williams suspended for the first six uh, weeks. You need him in the passing game, and um, he's electric. Every th- there, there are only two knocks on Jameer Gibbs. Every other thing, he checks the box of college production, outstanding, uh, speed, just outrageous. He's sub 4-4. Four, four. Uh, pass catching ability, phenomenal. I mean, that's why they drafted him. Draft capital, yes, sir. Uh, there, there's there's nothing wrong other than he is a little lighter. You know, 199, okay. But at some point, you have to throw that out the window. And I'm to that point. I, I was Mr. Worry about Gibbs. He was number three in my pre-NFL draft rankings because... I thought that the NFL would view him that way. They didn't. They said, we want to make him the, a centerpiece of our offense, and they're going to give him enough opportunities to be very relevant for fantasy. And with his explosive nature, if you give a guy, you know, 240 combined touches, and a lot of them are coming in the passing game, he will rip off massive big plays, big runs. The only other fear, and this was my fear about Bijan going there, is the curse of Barry Sanders and the Lions organization ruining every good thing that they have at running back since him? I was carry on Swift. I mean, Gibbs is he's he is up against it, and that curse scares me. As far as dynasty startup rankings, he's my running back four for dynasty running back rankings. But as far as startup, you know, you see him, you know, as high as you know, high end first round, and I don't draft that way. He's uh, back into the second round because I want those young stud wide receivers in a dynasty startup. I was gonna just say like the Lions is is the the main headline here, and I'm I'm being joking a little bit, but like how they utilize him along with David Montgomery is going to be the key in the story. Jared Goff, how efficient he is, and then who is their quarterback beyond this year? Is it still Goff? Is it someone else? But I think we can all comfortably say the the main outcome that we would see in his rookie year. He's probably going to get 50 plus receptions. I I looked at, you know, CMC's first season. Okay. We forget, like, CMC was drafted eighth overall by the Panthers. He only had 117 carries. Okay. That that first year, he had 80 receptions. So less than 200 touches, but he finished as the RB11 in that rookie year. If that happened, you would look at this season and say, like, wow, that, that was awesome. And I would say it would only accelerate like what people think about him like to be an rb2 or three in in dynasty and let's be honest like players with this draft capital are going to hold their value for at least two to three years apart from a major injury and yeah there's just it's really hard to poke holes other than the lions i I actually think that there is you know the 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 lions thing notwithstanding or or half withstanding there are holes to poke when i look at the range of outcomes for gibbs i don't see I really don't see like a median outcome being the most likely, which is really, really rare, right? By definition, the median outcome is like what you expect the most realistic thing to to happen. But I believe they're either going to utilize him in a role that is so fantasy fantastic with giving him 80, 
90, 100 targets, and he is a PPR machine. He's an Austin Eckler, a Christian McCaffrey, a top five running back going forward. Or they're going to utilize him as a, an extremely potent, uh, small smattering, explosive athlete on the NFL field, help him to open things up, and they don't give him enough touches, and he's you know getting sub- nine carries a game and he's not an 80 target player in which case he's going to be a complete bust for fantasy and he's going to be cj spiller who was a first round draft pick smaller back electric speed cj spiller had a running back seven finish in his career but for the most part was a tragic waste of a pick and a bust like you kind of you kind of got to call your shot i think it's going to be one of those two outcomes i don't I don't think he has a career where he is the running back 16, the running back 18, and every year he's just a really locked and loaded, solid RB2. I, I, I feel like he's fire and ice. All right, Betts, any last thoughts on Gibbs? Just one more thing with the draft capital. Like I, I mentioned kind of some of the weight concerns, but you look at historically what these guys get in year one as round one NFL draft picks. And this, I, I could have even gone deeper with this and said, who goes in the top 15? Here's what they get. But just round one NFL running backs since 2015, average 18 touches per game. If he's getting that 50, 60, 70 plus reception workload, he will clear this mark and he's going to be good for fantasy. So I agree that he does have a big ceiling with that pass catching role. But as Jason said, I do agree. It's sort of a wide range of outcomes not much of like, you know, the Najee where you can hang your hat on. He's going to be RB 14, 15, you know, worst case scenario sort of thing. I do think it's a bit wider than that for, for Jameer Gibbs. Let's just continue the theme. We're going to move to wide receiver, but I guess I'm bringing up another Alabama player. They're good, so might as well. But it's your boy, big booty, Jerry Judy, uh, 24 years old, two years left. They picked up his fifth year option and... I feel like last year was like the make or break year, but I feel like we're kind of pushed it down the road because we didn't know what to do with Russell Wilson. So we're at like another make or break year. I feel like Jerry Judy's had like three or four of those. I'm a huge fan this year in redraft and in dynasty, I have him on a team and I'm trying to weigh like, should I trade him now? Is the excitement for what Jerry Judy can be this year bigger than what I can get, you know, production wise or what, what I can get in a trade so I'm asking, you know, for a friend myself, guys, I need help with Jared Judy's. What's his high end outcome for this year, but also for the next couple of years? Because if Jerry Judy, like if he's not a top 15 wide receiver, am I just playing the DJ Moore game? Yep. Like that's, that's what I'm scared of. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's the likeliest outcome for me. I know Mike has him ranked extremely high. He still has a few teams left, so he won't finish at 10, but currently sits at number 10 last I looked for his ranking so um Jerry Judy's upside case is that Russell Wilson figures it out with Sean Payton and the talent that he came in from college I mean he was one of the most exciting prospects coming out of college since like Odell Beckham just so his his stop on a dime turn around quick twitch just was outstanding and you you have seen flashes of that you've seen some some routes that just make you goo goo gaga for this guy but we're we've had a lot of time you know we're we're going into year four and i believe what jerry judy has been is who he is he's gonna be a wide receiver that's got some talent shows some flashes has some good games disappears makes some drops is an above average NFL wide receiver and I think you 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 nailed it perfectly for what I see as his highest probability outcome which is DJ Moore. DJ Moore's not bad. DJ Moore's had a lot of fantasy relevance over the last 3 years. Most managers though with DJ Moore have been disappointed every single year. They're frustrated, they don't feel like they're getting enough good starts out of him and but but he's still young, he's still talented. Right. And so he holds his value. So it's funny because it's like in the end for fantasy, you need to care less about holding your value and more about scoring fantasy points because like that's what you have to do to win. But it is still good to have a guy that can hold his value. So to me, if you're saying, should you trade him? I believe that if he comes out and has another DJ Moore season, you will be able to trade him for the same value 
at the end of the year that you could now. So yeah, I would hold him and hope that we're wrong and he has his explosive Sean Payton, Russell Wilson rejuvenation and has a wide receiver one finish because at that point, he's magma. Yeah, if he's a wide receiver one this year, then you are looking, moving forward of this is who this guy is. We never saw DJ Moore hit that, you know, hit that mark. So, Betts, let's say he's, this is a very DJ Moore line. Let's say Jerry Judy finishes the wide receiver 18. Would you be happy with that as a manager? Or are you still like, just like, okay, well, this is kind of his top end outcome at this point. I think that's what this conversation is all about in Dynasty is is trying to be realistic with the players that you have on your roster or the guys you're trying to acquire and asking yourself, what is the range of outcomes for this player? And the DJ Moore sort of thing makes a lot of sense where it's like for years, everything in his profile said he should be a wide receiver one for fantasy. He should put it in the top 12 season. He should get over the touchdown you know, hump that he couldn't get over. He should be so much better. But sometimes these guys settle in as locked in yearly wide receiver twos, top 24 options. Here's the thing in Dynasty. That's good. <laughs> like That's good to have on your team. So I think it's just all about how you view the player and how you view the possibilities. I think a, a wide receiver one outcome top 12 for Jerry Judy is possible. If Russell Wilson can turn it around, if the efficiency metrics that he does have in his profile come true. Is it likely? Certainly not. I don't think it's very likely at all. So if someone in your league is valuing him as that, then I would trade him away. If you are realistic with it and say, I got a wide receiver 20 for the next three years, that is awesome in Dynasty. And I think people don't understand sometimes there can only be 12 wide receiver ones every single year. And they're oftentimes the same guys because they're so dang good. So it's just a matter of how you value value him. But there is a lot to like about Jerry Judy. I mean, 6.1 yards after the catch per reception was sixth in the NFL last year. 2.18 yards for outrun. That was 12th. I mean... Russ, 3.3% touchdown rate was his career low. Even if he's not good, if he just kind of bounces back to average, like you can tell yourself a story where Jerry Judy does have kind of a breakout year finally here at age 24. And remember that three touchdown game against the Chiefs where I said you should play Russell Wilson in DFS and Betts (laughs) laughed at me? Yeah, yeah. I literally laughed on the show. (laughs) I said, Kyle, you idiot. All right. I just went out there and (laughs) he was awesome. Let me give you a couple names real quick. Quick hitters here. Would you rather have Jerry Judy or a fellow first round Rookie wide receiver from the same class, Brandon Ayuk. I'm going to take the upside case with Judy. I think I would take Judy as well. I would go Judy as well. All right. What about Jerry Judy or Christian Watson? I will take the upside case with Christian (laughs) Watson. Uh, Younger going into year two. We talk about those year, year two wide receiver bets. It is more likely if one of these guys has a breakout for it to happen in year two than in year four. Yep. Completely agree with that. What if I told you that they are just a month apart in age? I would tell you that they are (laughs) several years apart in in draft year. I'm warming up to Christian Watson. I think I've been a hater, but I think they will use him in much more creative ways than just, oh, he's a nine-route guy. I think they're going to have to this next year. One more. Did you see him do a backflip? Have you seen his backflip? I'm just asking because it's not often, uh, outside of Anthony Richardson, that you see a man that size just casually backflip. Dude is a crazy freak athlete. All right, let me give you a rookie name. Would you rather have Zay Flowers or Jerry Judy in Dynasty? Oh, that's funny. (laughs) That is funny. Uh, Betts, why don't you answer that question? What's funny is I was going to go right to your rankings, Jason, (laughs) in in the UDK and uh, and answer that way, but I didn't have time to. So I'll go with kind of off the cuff. Um, I think I would rather have Zay Flowers simply because these round one wide receivers will hold their value entering year two. And and it's the same conversation. These year two guys will break out if the opportunity presents itself. And I love this Ravens offense this year. So I think I lean that way, but man, it is so close. Round wide receiver, round one wide receivers hold their value. Case in point, Jerry Judy, who has (laughs) not ever broken out to the purposes and in, 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 in the ideals that fantasy managers had for him and he still holds his value you could still get quite a bit for Jerry Judy I would agree with you and I would agree with my own rankings which I have in front of me I have Zay Flowers a few spots ahead of Jerry Judy if you want to Jason you can just take DJ Moore's career path because he's a couple years ahead and just copy and paste that into Judy and you just you already have that done in the statistical projections mm, thank you uh all right speaking of round one wide receivers I want to give one more here Jordan Addison, who I think all three of us love a lot, 
21 years old. He's taken 23rd overall. Right now, he is 104 in our rookie ranks, 107 in Superflex rankings. It's tough when you look at a player that you can just firmly say this is the number, this is not the number one target on the team. Okay, so like, you're not going to look at this player and say he's going to be an alpha in year one, and then it kind of says, where's he going to go after this? The easiest thing to do for me is to go, oh, he can just do what Devonta Smith did since he's the diet version of Devonta Smith. And as a rookie, Devonta Smith was really good. He had a 22% target share. His targets per route run was approaching 20%. Those were great. But as a rookie, do you remember Devonta Smith being great for fantasy? Like no. For being a top 10 pick? No, I don't think I remember him being great for fantasy as far as like redraft. Um, I do remember him being great as an NFL player, like watching him being like, because with his size and his, his, you know, BMI, all of the worries about whether he can actually take on NFL corners, NFL defenders, and get off press and all, all of those worries because he was such a stick figure. I remember watching his rookie year and being like, yes, yes, that's the dude. That is the guy that dominated in college. He's smoking these, and if he can play in the NFL. And so even though he wasn't like a, you know, a home run, uh, rookie sensation. Um, I absolutely thought he was, he was really great. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to just going to say it. I don't see how Jordan Addison fails. I just, I like, I can't imagine a world. I know. I know you, when, <laughs> whenever you're that, uh, hard lined, it will always fail and come back to bite you. But it's just one of those things where his skill set, opposite Justin Jefferson, with a quarterback like Kirk Cousins who will find the open man and will throw for 4,500-plus yards, the depth chart there, he's going to be the wide receiver too. I I can't imagine him failing at all. Like I, I The only way he fails is if he's actually not a good wide receiver and he can't handle NFL DBs. The problem with that is he's a super good wide receiver who will smoke these NFL DBs. Yes. Kevin O'Connell in his presser when he was talking about Jordan Addison said, we needed somebody to take the like double teams because they're always on Justin Jefferson. Like Double teams has kind of overstayed the NFL, but this guy really was double team, and there was nobody else who consistently get open and create separation. Hawkinson was more necessary to the offense, and the way they described it was like, Addison gets open, he's a separator, and I think he's going to be good. Devonta Smith's rookie year, 101 targets, 64 receptions, 916 yards. That would be perfectly fine for Jordan Addison if he were to do that. The upside case is if he goes over two yards per route run, he's in like an elite tier. I think that's asking a lot in the rookie year um, with Justin Jefferson there. But I think we would say like Jordan Addison just feels like a very safe prospect when you think about today's NFL. Like you wouldn't have said that, you know, five, ten years ago. Like, oh, this is a safe prospect uh, you know, with his height and weight, but yeah, and you don't and you don't worry about Justin Jefferson. You you thank Justin Jefferson. You don't worry about Jamar Chase with T. Higgins. You don't worry about Tyree Kill with Jalen Waddle. You don't worry about Devonta Smith with A.J. Brown. Two dominant wide receivers. When there is that kind of uh, coagulation of uh, target market share, is just so great. Where it's like you know it's going to those two guys. They're they're going to be, you know, 1A and 1B, even though one that's not fair to call someone a 1A when they are otherworldly dominant. We'll call it a 1 and 2, but the, the 2 is so good in this situation. I I really, really love Jordan Addison. I, I don't think he's going to fail as a rookie. I don't think he's going to fail uh, in his career. Yep. I I took him at 1.04 in that uh, rookie mock draft we did, and I said, look, there's no denying like Justin Jefferson will always be the wide receiver one in this offense. That is not going to change. But the thing is, <laughs> whoever the quarterback is, you know, Kirk Cousins, we, we've seen that he can support two wide receivers. We've seen talented wide receivers earn targets. And in year one, like, I think they're literally going to say, okay, here's one-on-one -on -one coverage, you know, the NFL defensive coordinators, Jordan Addison, go beat us. And I think he can do that. So I agree with you guys. Uh, I like it. Kirk Cousins last, last year, fourth in the NFL in pass attempts. They were tied for second, Minnesota was in neutral uh, pass rate, that's not going to change, especially if they lose Dalvin Cook, which there's a lot of rumors about, and they add a first-round wide receiver, their moves are telling us what they plan to do, and it's throw, throw, throw. I will say this. 
uh, funniest, saddest thing uh, to have a little bit of a, a little bit of negativity into this conversation. I was watching the Bleacher Report draft coverage during that time in the uh, in in the dra- the back end of Lefko. Yes, it was the Lefko coverage. Great job, and uh, they had Kirk Cousins on. They had him on live during the draft pick. Like they they brought him on. It was like oh. And so they were asking him, and they put him on the spot before the pick. He's like, who do you want? <laughs> and, oh, no. and Kirk Cousins' answer was he wanted the he wanted Jameer Gibbs, but he was gone. He's like, we hoped we you know, could get that Alabama guy, uh, you know, but but he's gone. And then they draft Jordan Addison. And I was like, what a great pick. Man, Kirk Cousins has to be absolutely ecstatic, just thrilled. You 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 lose Adam Thielen, you get a Bolitnikoff Award winner, just awesome. Go to Kirk Cousins. What do you think? He's like, I don't know who that is. He didn't know who. He's like, oh, based on what you guys are saying, that sounds really great. But I mean, I know he's not a college scout. He's not. Clearly, he is not <laughs> following the college ball. But I was so shocked. It's like, at the very least, lie. At the at the very least, you don't know the top four wide receiver prospects while you're a quarterback in the NFL who's on live on a draft coverage show <laughs> like what? it was just it was so sad it was like oh okay well all right you I, I i guess you are really letting the gm take the reins you're not having any say i will say addison just from his like draft get up looked like a baby boy he looked like he was on the J, like jv team like he's small he is super tiny that, i mean that that is how it fa- that you know i said he's going to smoke nfl dbs but the way it fails is that he's too small to succeed in the NFL. I don't think that's going to happen, but that is his path towards failure. And if that happens, it's abject failure. It's complete and utter uh, don't hold your value, can't win. But I, but again, won't happen. Let me just give you some numbers. I looked at top 25 drafted rookie wide receivers, so he was taking 23rd overall. If they get 10 games played, I had to you know filter out the John Rosses and Kevin Whites of the world uh, who just didn't well, play. Well, how convenient. Those guys sucked. <laughs> they didn't play. They got hurt. They were bad. Uh, they averaged... 7.6 targets per game, 104 targets over a season. So I think that's okay. kind of... I've got what, him for 108 targets. Yeah, I think that's what you can look for in a medium range. It's hard to see the case of him just being a T. Higgins level in my mind immediately. Like, just he's the number two. He's going to kill it. But, you know, I think you have a very safe player. Uh, that'll be really, really fun. Yeah, well, finish. T. Higgins got to come in and be the one as, as a rookie. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't have Chase yet. You know, it was it was, uh, it, was a, it was a it was a nicer process. But uh, yeah, Jordan, Jordan Addison's going to be very solid this year, and then a stud in year two. All right, guys, let's talk about one more player. And I just want to ask you: Are you ready to feel pain? Are you ready to be hurt? I can knowing the player we're going to talk about and my years long. Um, anti this player i could tell you i am for the first time yes yes fully ready to be hurt there's nothing (laughs) there's nothing like a good relationship where you're just no like i you actually can expect it you know what's coming and this is a player where kyle pitts is just ready to hurt you and in dfs bets you i mean week one people are going to be firing away oh you and me you and me both and uh i wish i didn't have to Look at my bank account or my my DraftKings account. I don't understand how much I fired away with the Kyle Pitts upside that was there. And what's funny is I've talked myself into and out of Kyle Pitts for this season multiple times already, and it's May, so I will feel all the emotions <laughs> come August. And I can't wait to find out that I'm wrong, no matter which side of the fence I land on. Guys, we're in year three. He's 22.6 years old. So apparently he just doesn't, he didn't age mm-hmm. and doesn't want to. Uh, but he's got two years left on his rookie deal plus fifth year option. Still can't believe we took him fourth overall. Uh, we we uh, the Falcons are really good. They're really good at taking offensive players in the top ten. Like we've done it. Three They're really good of- at ruining them. Come on, don't do that with Bijan. Right now, Kyle Pitts in our startup rankings is the tight end two behind Mark Andrews. How big of a gap is that for you, Jason? Looking at those two players in startups. So it it it's a it's a pretty big gap just because where. Um, in a startup where you can draft so many awesome and known commodity wide receivers versus taking the hopeful upside that Kyle Pitts hits, Mark Andrews is known. 
Mark Andrews is young. He's in a great offense. He's tied to now a long-term quarterback in his situation. I'm in on Mark Andrews. I'm willing to, to spend a high draft pick in a startup on him. Spending a high draft pick on Kyle Pitts is something that I am only willing to do when all of those young, middle-of-their-career wide receivers are gone because I want high hit rates in my startup drafts. Now, obviously, the lottery ticket that Kyle Pitts is, should he hit... It's an expensive lottery ticket. It, it's an expensive lottery ticket, but the lottery tickets that pay out the most, they usually cost the most, and um, he's he's worth it. Like I said, I am... For the first time ever, I'm in on Kyle Pitts. I, I have not, I wasn't in on him rookie year. I wasn't in on him last season. And I am, my, my exposure right now, I find that I am drafting him a ton in, uh, best ball drafts and redraft leagues. I think he's going to have a very good season. And he is so young. I mean, it takes tight ends a little while, and he was injured for half of last year. It's, he had a thousand yards as a rookie, <laughs> you know. The downside case is obviously the quarterback play, and the quarterback play is going to be bad. But I don't believe that Kyle Pitts is bad. Now, Kyle, I know you spent today watching, like, did you watch every single one of his targets? Every every 20-plus yard target. Every t Okay, so give it to us. Tell, oh. tell us. tell us first about Kyle Pitts, not about Marcus Mariota. I'll try it. So that was a quarter of his targets this past year were deep ones. And... I did a little thread on Twitter. Wasn't trying to game the algo bets, okay? Oh, just yes, giving... you were. Such an algo, bro. No, just 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 giving it out there. But uh, he caught one of them, one of the 14, and I would say maybe three or four of them were catchable. Okay, one he, he straight up dropped. But with Kyle Pitts, you look at deep targets as something that is super valuable for fantasy and also up and down. Like I know I'm throwing this player out. There. Marvin Jones used to be the deep 50-50 ball guy he'd have years where he'd lead the league in, in the category and then just be trashed the next year they're pretty volatile type of targets right contested catches mm -hmm. so with Kyle Pitts you hit a very bad side of variance last year I'm not saying it's going to swing back this year I just don't know if it can get worse than one out of 14 where Marcus Mariota just overthrew it time and time again I think what I'm worried about if I was the Kyle Pitts manager is I'm stuck I can't trade him for what I have or what I drafted him as I don't think people are going to value I think people are going to poke fun and say you have Kyle Pitts you're stuck I'm not going to trade you for it so then you're just kind of waiting am I going to get an 80 catch season and if he did that then I feel like I can be confident and say that he's like actually hitting value and he could be the tight end one in dynasty next year if he did that but the likely outcome to me is that the passing volume remains low he's maybe the tight end five tight end six and and you're still like still behind the eight ball. So I don't know, Bets, like what do you see as like his median range for this year? And then what does that do to his dynasty value for the next two to three years? Well, I, I want to kick it back to Jason real quick, just because Jason mentioned so confidently he thinks he's going to have a good season. What does that mean, right? Because like Kyle Pitts could finish as the tight end five, but like we know a lot of times it doesn't really matter, right? Like unless you're giving us that tight end one, tight end two, tight end three season doesn't really make a huge difference for your team so do you see him as having that potential top three sort of season this year Jason uh, I I right now I've got him as my tight end four I, I and you're wise to point out that unless you are doing one of those humongous awesome uh you know seasons where you are separating yourself from the field tight end four sounds better than it is you know tight end seven can be a complete outright bust and you're like oh he was a tight end one three years in a row it's, yeah that it's irrelevant um so I have Kyle Pitts basically being the first tight end past the ones that really separate from the position um now that's more of my medium out median outlook for him I've got him for 820 yards six touchdowns a really solid season um I'm in on that because I think that that is a very realistic outcome and he's no longer that second round pick. You know, I'm getting him in the sixth round where, you know, the running backs and wide receivers that I love are already off the board. So if that's a median outcome where it's just a, a you know, a nice season, I would be okay with spending my sixth on that. But of course he has that upside where he could go out and get 10 touchdowns and a thousand yards, which 
you know, if you say how many tight ends out there could get a thousand yards and ten touchdowns, Travis Kelsey could do it. Mark Andrews could do it. If all the other injuries happened to San Francisco, at least the physical ability of George Kittle could do it, won't do it because of his situation. I think that's the end of the list that I see, 1,010. I mean, then it would be Kyle Pitts. I think you're right. I tried to fit Goddard in that category, but it's really hard in that offense apart from an injury to do it. But if Kyle Pitts finishes top three of the position this year, you know, he hits kind of a higher range, would he then vault ahead of Mark Andrews in your mind in dynasty startups? Right now, Kyle Pitts is like a third, fourth round startup pick in super flex, you know, fourth round. But like, you're then saying he, I think he can be the tight end one if he has that season. Yeah. I mean, it, the age gap between Andrews and Kyle Pitts, there's a reason why rookie year Kyle Pitts, I could not trade Travis Kelsey plus my first for Kyle Pitts. And that was when he was younger. Um, it got rejected. Thank goodness that got rejected because I would be <laughs> crying over the last couple of seasons. Now, that Kyle Pitts is closer to a realistic tight end breakout age and Travis Kelsey is closer to a retirement age, I genuinely wonder if there are leagues where you could take Travis Kelsey and go just offer him straight up for Kyle Pitts and get that in a dynasty league. Um, fantasy managers who have felt the burn might want to be done with it. Um, I mean, I don't know how you guys feel, but I would do that for sure. I would much, much rather take the... Uh, the value that Kelsey has that we know is going to be expiring soon for that lottery ticket in Kyle Pitts. Uh, the fact that it's not a 100% guaranteed, like, of course, everyone would do that says that you could maybe get that trade done. Yeah. And the thing is a lot of teams like in leagues, I mean, they have pits and they're just sitting in the pit. Like their team is just, so they're just waiting. They, they can bide their time uh, cause where they got them. But I, yeah, I would do that flip right now, and it's not crazy for a contending team to be able to say, hey, I'm going to flip those two. Uh, man, any last thoughts on Pitts bets? I just want to point out one thing in terms of just the passing environment because last last year was like outlier low for what they had with Marcus Mariota, and I do think that regresses a little bit back to, I don't even want to say league average, but like closer to that. You know, They were at 44% neutral pass rate, dead last in football. That is insanely low. So I think that comes up a little. I'm just not sure it's going to make a, as big of a difference in terms of the passing volume there. But I will say, like Kyle mentioned, you know, the, the deep target thing with Marcus Mariota, like it was bad. Like it was bad, bad, bad. Like dead last among players that had a 25 plus percent target share and catchable target rate was Kyle Pitts. So even if Des Desmond Ritter isn't a good quarterback, if he's just not Marcus Mariota, like it really can't get worse for him. So I think I'm in on, on buying him as a bounce back candidate this year. Uh, I'm ready to get hurt again. You can look at all of our ranks in the ultimate draft kit, our startup ranks, our rookie rankings, all of those, but we have one more segment. Take it or leave it. I wanted to give one final parting thought of a player that we didn't list today. You can really do this with any player. That's what's so fun about dynasty that you think has a wider range of outcomes than maybe people realize. So just list one player. You don't have to you know, go super in-depth, but just who is one player that you are scared like, hey, I could see them hitting this ceiling. I could see them in you know, a year or two being you know, way down there. So, Betts, why don't you start us off? Yeah, the name I put on here was Ken Walker, which, you know, uh -huh, he's I love 20, it. I love 22 it. 22 years old. Former 30, 41st overall draft 30. pick. Insane NFL draft. <laughs> I'm tired, Kyle. It's the end of the show. Insane draft capital. Incredible rookie season. Everything that you look for is there. He's a good NFL running back. <laughs> and the Seahawks, man, they, they just... <laughs> what are they doing? Taking Zach Charbonnet uh, in the second round as well. Very good draft capital for him. So the way I see this is... Look, Ken Walker could just ice Zach Charbonnet. He could just be that good. And he could be next season where like, man... That was so silly of us for being so scared of Charbonnet. Look at Ken Walker. He was an RB1. We should value him as such. He's young. Or it really could be a true 50-50 split between those two guys, and he doesn't get the pass-catching role, and all of a sudden he's like the RB23, and you're like, okay, well, that's I guess that's who he is. So I could see a massive range of outcomes, and truthfully, I don't know which side I land on, um, which is, I think, the perfect player for this sort of segment. 
I will throw out a player that I am scared oh, of the bottom Kyle. falling out sooner than later. It's Stephon Diggs, okay? He's going to be 30 this, this year. And well, you can't say sooner than later with a 30-year-old. you got to say, you're, are you scared that it drops out this year? This year, I'm not. But I'm, I'm asking myself the question that in Dynasty, when is the point for a player like this that you, you trade them away? And well, I'm, I'm saying that as somebody. No, it's now. It's, 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 but it's a matter of what you can get. You, you know, what I've done in the past, when I would trade Julio Jones for CeeDee Lamb and a first, I, you know, now that seems just insane, right? Like, wait, wait, late career Julio Jones, you got, you know, a, a rookie CD Lamb plus another first, but that's the type of deal you do where you think you can get a young stud who's going to have just as good a career plus a first that's worth, you know, replenishing your roster. I, I'm, so I have Josh Allen. And it's a stack. Ooh, fun. So then I feel like... Well, you got to be winning championships with that, right? What league is this? <laughs> uh, it's it's a league you've never <laughs> heard of. Oh, it's a league that I'm the champion three years in a row. Oh, man. But Kyle, you've gotten close. you should not have brought that up. Dude. Oh, you just, man. You set yourself up loser. so bad for that. <laughs> I cannot wait. We will be talking about Jason's team two years from now. He's oh, gonna man. Be this gonna be, it's funny because that was the league. That, so the, the league where uh, Mike and I are champ, 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 uh, back to back to back title winners. Asterisk. That's no asterisk, just <laughs> flat fact. That's where I tried to trade away Travis Kelsey for right. Kyle Pitts plus right. a first and didn't get it. And Kelsey has helped me win those championships. But now I cannot offer Travis Kelsey for Kyle Pitts straight up. I just said I would do that deal. I can't. We can't. I can't offer Derrick Henry for a young stud plus picks. I can't. Mike Evans. Mike, we are not allowing ourselves to do what I usually do in Dynasty Leagues, which is um, get a younger player and a pick for a great aging player so that I can stay competitive. I am going – We because we're champ, champ, champ in a row, we have to go for it till the wheels fall off. I'm, I'm driving this thing into the ground – I will go in the grave, and then I will have to dig. We will have to dig ourselves up out of that because our team is so old. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for your demise, but also I think I'm, I have a small window as well. Like I've held on. My team is scrappy. I've been scrappy for years. You got to at least hand it to. Yeah, no, team. you're very scrappy. Very scrappy. We will, silvery. We had type a, of team. We had a championship in there too. All right, Jason, who's your player? My player is Hollywood. Hollywood. Marquise Hollywood Brown has been a great, awesome, and horrible <laughs> fantasy football asset over his career. Uh, flashes of brilliance, stretches of domination, periods of injury, uh, team problems around him. He is not very old right now. His range of outcomes is one where Kyler Murray misses the majority of this season. He's the number two behind Hopkins and irrelevant this year. The draft pick is extremely high. Maybe the Cardinals get Caleb Williams um, or Marvin Harrison Jr., Ooh. and now Hollywood is a year older and is irrelevant, and all of a sudden you feel like there's not much left in value for his career. I can see that path being realistic. I can also see the path where Kyler is actually playing the vast majority of the season. And Hopkins is traded uh, to a contender like he wants and like the Cardinals want. And all of a sudden, you have a young Hollywood Brown attached to a young Kyler Murray on what should be a pretty decent offense with a very bad defense. And now you've got a great fantasy asset that's proven playing for a long time with his college quarterback. So I, the range of outcomes for him, for me, is drastic. And if I had to bet... I'm going to bet on the talent. I believe Hollywood is extremely talented. I think he'll have several more years of relevance. Certainly is being undervalued, in my opinion, in the dynasty circles and startup circles, all fantasy circles. Venn diagrams with all the circles, <laughs> undervalued right in the middle. That's, uh, that, that is the city of Hollywood. Well, that sounds like we can work out a trade because he's on my team in that league, and we can talk about it very okay. soon. That's going to do it for us on this episode of the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. Check out our rankings, ultimatedraftkit.com. We'll see you next week.
Thanks for listening to the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. If you want to take your dynasty skills to the next level, check out the fantasyfootballers.com.